Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by J.P. Bouvet to talk about improvising on the drums. J.P., welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, really glad to have you here. I've heard your name. I've seen you play on social media and all that stuff. You're a, a monster player. And um, Brandon Green is the one who connected us. I want to give him a shout out right off the bat. He was on the biomechanics episode very recently, which uh, was a very cool one. You're his teacher, right? Right. Yeah. He's a student on my website. He's a great drummer in his own right and a great dude. Yes, absolutely. Um, I love when people can connect and tee up another episode. And uh, and here we are today. So um, I think this is a really neat one because improvising, um, I feel like it comes easier to some people than others. Uh, I feel like drums sort of lend themselves to improvising more than other instruments, I'd say. Um, so just to hop in here, Let's start at the most basic question. What is and how would you describe improvising on the drums? Yeah, um, let's let's make our first foray here pretty general because I think we're going to revisit this and define it with much greater detail as we go. Um, but really what I would say is um, what improvising is, is having a lot of options and having the control over them to be able to move between them fluidly. And to eventually, ideally, get to a point where you're moving between them sort of by accident. In the same way that you speak, sure. you think of something you want to say, the pieces, the individual pieces, fill themselves in, and you have a lot of options, a lot of ways you can move. And that is a little bit of foreshadowing for when we get into the details. A lot of people think that improvisation, or let's say creativity, is like a personality trait. It's something you have, it's something you channel. Um, and I over now that I nowadays, uh, specialize in teaching improv and creativity, I know for a fact that that is absolutely not the case. Uh, there's nothing about, there's no innate ability to create, to create or to improvise. And it's actually surprisingly systematic once you get into it. I mean, that's, that's where I have begun to thrive as an educator is everything in, in my educational world is a step-by-step -step process that that's. That's not woo-woo. There's no like, okay, now just, you know, light some candles and, and see what happens. It's all <laughs> yeah. really, really methodical. And it, it yeah, leads to people having a ton of freedom. Typically when people think creativity, improvising, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's really interesting that you're teaching it because it's, it is something like you said that I, like, I could see people saying, oh, I wasn't born with that. I'm not creative, uh, which it's sort of like a barrier that people put up for themselves and say, and they're stopping themselves from, you know, being able to be creative. And another thing that comes to mind about, uh, it's funny because before we started, you used the word latency and we were talking about recording. It's almost like the more you practice the latency from your brain to your hands with creativity would get smaller, meaning the delay of time that it takes you to think and get it out of your brain into your hands and just on the fly quickly, very quickly make a decision uh, and just get out of problems, <laughs> you know? A hundred percent. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that really is, you know, obviously automation is a huge part of playing the drums, but the one of the sort of mantras I'm always reminding my students is we need to be able to sim think simple thoughts while we play progressively more complex things. Because the truth of the matter is when you see the, you know, your favorite, the craziest drummer playing the craziest stuff, they're not thinking crazy thoughts. They're thinking really simple thoughts because we all have the same limited amount of attention. And we can all focus on one thing at a time and we shift between things very quickly. We all are like severely limited in that regard. But when you see really advanced drumming, those people have automated more, more um, complexity into a single thought, right? So I think I'm going to play like uh, this melody, right? And a really advanced drummer can execute that melody completely effortlessly. So the technique, the coordination, the independence is all built in, but also a variety of, of creative variations, right? Different uh, like orchestrations, different arrangements of the pattern. Those are all built into a single thought. So it yeah. really is a matter of, of consolidating more and more complexity into these simple thoughts and, and teaching people to think what simple thoughts do we need to think and what do we need to package into that automation? What do we need to automate? So that, like you said, when we think of whatever the cue is or whatever the, the name we have for that vocabulary is, it gets executed with no latency, ideally no latency at all. And I love yeah. that you said uh, solving problems or whatever it was that you mentioned with the problems, because that is majorly 
a part of it is like when you're creating, when you're combining combinations, and when you're combining patterns in a novel way in real time, it might spit you out on a weird hand. It might spit you out on a count that you're not used to coming out on. And that's exactly what you need to be doing in real time is problem solving. And that, I yep. think, is part of why improv on the drums, or I, I assume on any instrument, is inherently rewarding from the get-go. Right? It's enough. Like, if I stop playing with musicians forever, I'll still come play my drums and create in the moment because mm -hmm. it feels like a game. You know, it feels like a balancing act, kind of like riding your bike where you can never yeah. fall asleep. You can keep, you ride your bike for the rest of your life. It doesn't become more challenging, but it stays rewarding for some reason, you know? Sure. Yeah, there's a certain uh, like productivity, like it feels like you're getting something done when you're improvising and you're just kind of going off the cuff. Now, that being said, there's there's something very important to practicing things that are systematically designed to make you better but you need a little bit of both. You know what I yeah. mean? But it feels so yeah. good to like practice uh, like for fun and just improvise. Yeah. And I would say there's uh, this is this is one of, I think, the most common misconceptions that students have about um, improvising is that you can't like create practice creativity. But so much of my success as a teacher teaching improvisation comes from setting very specific tight constraints and saying, OK, you have to improvise within these strategically chosen constraints in order to build this specific type of freedom within the, these, you know, these constraints. Yeah. Um, and it's always obviously relevant to a type of groove or a type of flow that they want to have. But at the end of pretty much every lesson that I teach on my site, I encourage people to switch into what I, you know, what I call creative practice mode, which is, okay, now improvise within the confines of what we just did in this lesson. Mm -hmm. So if we were... Um, actually, let me take, I just filmed a lesson that taught um, how to basically make melodies with your right hand, this thing I call the swung down up method, going down, down, up, 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 down, down, up, 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 down, down. You're switching from downbeat to upbeat, and you're doing so in an unfolding manner. And you work up to, a mi the big milestone is, uh, you know, be able to switch from down to up at random and not lose one. This is a form of sure. very basic improv. And then we took a step of putting the backbeat in. So now we have a groove down, up, do, got, don, da, don, do, down, up, 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 ba, dum, ba, dum. Okay, so then we work on, okay, any right hand is a fair target for a kick drum. So we've basically created a game. And now, yeah. as a creative exercise, I say, okay, we've just again, went through a bunch of exercises with specific examples to build the coordination. Now, after you spend whatever, 20 minutes doing that, take 10 minutes. And don't leave these rules, right? Just play swung down up grooves with a backbeat. And the only freedom you have is to choose which right hands you put kick drums with. Mm, because that's, that's such cool. a crucial element of improv in modern drumming um, that has to be, it has to be developed in its own, on its own. So you have this little improv mini game that you play, but the yeah. rules are designed to give you a skill that you need at the sort of end goal of the course, which is just like improvising in triplet grooves, if you will. Anyways, one example of a creative exercise. The constraints are so key. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And, and I, I should have mentioned this up front, but your website, jpbouvetmethod.com, which will be in the description. I mean, you can look at it. And the first tab is improvisers club. I mean, so this is really I think people should figure this out, you know, at this point of us talking. But really, it is the cornerstone of your teaching. And I think that's uh very cool, because I don't know many teachers who use it as their um, kind of thing they hang their hat on of like, if this is you're going to get freedom from learning with you uh, as opposed to more just um, strict rules. I think that's really cool that you're doing that. I just want to make sure people know that, like, obviously, that's your thing. But so, um, JP, we talked about a few things before and uh, misconceptions we, you mentioned what in your experience, are some of those major misconceptions that people have about improvising? Yeah. Um, the first is the misconception that when you improvise, you're pulling random ideas like out of some bucket of ideas in your mind or some bucket of patterns or combinations and that it's randomly combined. And now I, I kind of tire of speech analogies because like they're as different as they are similar, but this works, right? When I'm speaking, the next word I use is not randomly pulled from all the words that I know in my vocabulary. 
that word is determined by everything I just played and is determined by the subject, the topic of conversation. In drums, it's a similar thing where when, where like, uh, uh, like your vocabulary is organized into sort of clusters that are relevant, right? If we are talking about drums, a bunch of words are on my mind, paradiddle, that won't be on my mind if we're talking about, I don't know, the economy or something else. Yeah, yeah. That sort of, uh, uh, it um, cues up a whole set of other words. So in the same way, when you're playing the drums, there, it, there are patterns that work really well together. And they, they should be clustered together because, uh, because just of how well they work together. For example, uh, one example would be right, left, left, kick, right, a super common pattern, right, left, left, kick, right, left, left, kick, right, left, left, kick, right, left, left, kick. A lot of people get to that point. But also, so that's a group of four, right? A group of two would be right, left, right, left, left, kick, right, left, right, left, left, kick, right, left, left, kick, right, left, right. Now I'm already able to improvise a little bit. And then I throw in like a, a right, left, left, kick, right, or sorry, right, left, kick, right, left, kick, a group of six. So I've got a two, four, six. Doesn't matter what they are, but in this case, they happen to work super well together. Now I have three sort of like pieces of conversation that I am going to somewhat permanently attach to each other. So that when I'm playing right, left, left, kick, right, left, left, kick, I don't have to think what of a billion options could I play? I've got these yeah. ones that are always kind of adjacent to it. And I know that it fits, right? I'm in straight time. I'm playing 16th notes. I'm flowing on the kit. A lot of stuff gets excluded. And now I've got uh, uh, a little more guidance. So anyways, yeah. and that happens when, when you're playing in the moment, when you're improvising. If I'm playing a bunch of paradiddle snare vocabulary, right? The next thing I play, like ideally a bunch of stuff lines up in my mind that's adjacent to that. That's really similar. That's just other snare patterns or other diddle rudiments, a paradiddle diddle, a double paradiddle, a bunch of doubles in a row that are diddles. So you create these sort of pockets. It's not what completely random thing am I going to pull out of my mind. So that's, I'd say, misconception number one. Misconception number two is uh, don't think. Worst advice. Worst advice possible for a beginner or intermediate improviser uh, is don't think. But there's a caveat because usually the people giving this advice are are correct like they're not wrong so when you're at this is like like this is like the the stereotype is you're at a drum clinic watching an incredible drummer and someone goes you know what's going through your mind as you're playing this completely insane stuff and they go nothing like i am yeah. just flowing and i'm in i'm cha i'm channeling the muses and the drummer a beginner intermediate goes, well, if, if you're supposed to just not think and amazing things are supposed to happen, I clearly don't have whatever I need to have because when I don't think, amazing things don't happen. The problem yeah. is the master drummer on stage has already done all the work to automate all the patterns. They have crazy melodic you know, vocabulary. They have it all in there. And at that arrival point, it's true that you can go into flow mode and pretty much turn your brain off and watch the show and amazing things happen. But 99.9% sure. .9 of drummers do not have that level of facility. Yeah. And a beginner or an intermediate drummer needs explicit instructions. And there's so many useful things they could do. Like we talked about creative exercises. We could sit here and think about creative exercises for hours that would build the ability to move between options. Like we said in the beginning, like, yeah. Impro improvising is moving between options, rearranging pieces. There could be a lot of real technical work that they do, um, but it requires thinking. The other thing is with don't think, um, when you're drumming, even when you get to a place, and a lot of my students get to this place after just a couple courses where uh, like, uh, you know, whatever vocab we've built, within the confines of that sort of subset, I call it, they're able to improvise pretty freely and kind of listen to the show, you know? They can't play everything yeah. in the world, but they can play like a lot of improv within this, this area. But the thing is, a lot of times, you know, you're anxious or you turn the camera on and you start to get like, you know, red light syndrome. And totally. yeah. you, you need to be able to perform well when you are thinking really hard, when you're really yeah. kind of in your head, when it's totally impossible to say like, yeah, I'm going to turn my mind off and just flow. Right. Still, at, at this point in, in my career, 20-some years into drumming and specializing in improv, when I go to the studio and they push record, it's not the same. Yeah, I sure. am in my head. I need to be able to think of things. And therefore, like creative strategies or ways of thinking about your vocabulary, again, think, like 
here are some thoughts <laughs> uh, yeah. are very helpful as opposed to don't think. Yeah. Well, I mean, in my experience too, of like doing uh, like jingle sessions and things like that for like radio spots, sometimes you, they don't want you to improvise. Like you got to also throw that in there where it's like, uh, if you're doing a spot where like, all right, it's a tight 30 or a tight 60 and just do this for this like hot tub company, just do it. We don't need craziness. Play a two, four beat for 32 measures with one fill with a Pat Boone, Debbie Boone crash out and then be done. And then, you know, yes, maybe do a couple other takes with some improvising. But I think sometimes, though, you got to like know when to not improvise. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I like to uh, I like to think that. Well, I mean, it's just it is the fact. But when so with whatever like uh, setting one might be working on improvisation um, in, I like to think that what you're really doing is you're developing options and you're getting a ton of control with them. So like what looks to the out- on the outside like a really creative sound of fluid thing in your mind is actually like kind of boring, right? You're thinking like, well, I'm going like, to play threes on the kick. I'm going to link up my right hand with that, right? But on the other side, it sounds like music is happening. And the, the sort of happy byproduct of that is that you develop the vocabulary in general. So when you have a session and they're like, yeah, like don't improv. This is the beat. Doom, ka-doom, yeah. doom, doom, ka-doom. The thing is, in your improv practice, you've done all this melodic work, let's say with a kick drum. So sure. when you're in the session and they call out some kick drum melody, you've got the facility to execute it. So it's a weird sort of like practicing improv gives you all the options so that when someone just like says, hey, play this option, you yeah. can nail it without improvising. Well, and then there's also going, continuing down that road of like, you're improvising. Uh, let's say you're improvising on a track and you're playing and then they say, oh, wait, play that thing again. And then it's kind of like, well, wait, what did I just play? Do you have any right. tricks for like kind of remembering what you're doing or recalling what you just did? You know? Yeah, well, this is another uh, argument for uh, developing sort of a, a mental framework for thinking about your vocabulary. Like, so I mentioned like subsets, these sort of groupings of whatever, uh, of groupings of, of patterns, but there's also m- actual melodies. I'm always talking about rhythmic melodies, which is just rhythms, rhythmic yep. melodies that uh, are also grouped together, right? So for example, dotted eighth notes and what I call dotted doubles. So you've got three E and a four E and a groups of three, three E and a four E and a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And then the doubled version of that, one, three E and a four E and a one and a two and a three and da da. So those groups of three, those are always sort of permanently join to each other. They're, they're there together. Yeah. So when your melody making gets sort of clustered into categories as well, and you have a, a structure for thinking about them, then when someone says, what did you just play? You hear the echo of it in your mind. But the thing uh, is, at that, at that point, you're, you understand the rhythms you're playing on a deeper level, and they become yeah. quite a bit simpler because every, for example, every measure long melody you play is built up of a lot of the same pieces, right? Groups of three, consecutive downbeats, consecutive upbeats. So you sort of categorize these things. And in, then when you look at a measure, instead of seeing 16 16th notes and you need to remember like which ones are on and off basically, mm-hmm. you see, oh, the first half of this is groups of three. And the second half of this is, you know, a bunch of upbeats in a row. I only need, I only need to think of two things now, not 16. And yeah. I'll be able to recognize, remember, replay that in a way. So it's all about, again, yeah. we need to be able to think simple thoughts. So we need to consolidate our melodic thinking and our patterns and our recognition of notation and the feeling, the procedural memory, the muscle memory into these, these packages that can essentially uh, like execute automatically. Yeah. I have a, to kind of pivot to something else here a little bit, I have a distinct memory as a kid uh, I was probably fourth or fifth grade. Um, you know, I've been playing drums for a while and there was a kid who was the like, you know, star piano player in the class. He was really good. He was great. I won't say his name, but, uh, I remember he came over and I was like, this is gonna be awesome. We're going to play together. We're going to jam. He sat down and was playing like a classical piece. And I was sitting down on the, you know, drum set with like rock, you know, playing with other friends who have a little guitar and drum just experience with jamming with friends he could not not play like classical pieces he could not kind of just go like 
dum 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 and then like jam with his right hand and and just go there's certain instruments i feel like where like we kind of talked about before but like there's certain instruments that just it doesn't work as well and i feel like piano when you're classically trained i obviously people can improvise on the piano and they're great at it but as kids i feel like you're taught as a piano player to not really have that freedom or it doesn't come to maybe your old lady piano teacher to go with the like generic stereotype of a piano teacher um and i just thought that was really interesting you know it's like well, as a fifth grader, I'm like, well, why can't this kid just kind of make stuff up? But right, that's what kids are supposed granted. to do, right? It's supposed yeah. to, you know, mess around. Yeah, it yeah. is interesting, and I think, I think part of it too. I mean, and I just happen to play the drums, but I do think that this is true. I don't, I don't think I'm being like drums are special. Um, and we hit things with sticks. I mean, they're yeah. not that special, you know. But <laughs> um, on the piano, the guitar, the bass to a slightly lesser degree, most instruments, there's a lot of like stuff to learn and play and memorize and like play songs, you know? And the drums, there's not so much a culture of like, you know, learn a piece, you know? You can learn songs, but it's really not the same because yeah. you can't go play that song without the music that it, ac- that it accompanies it. No, no. I remember learning Pretty Woman as a kid in like a, cl- like a, like a clinic kind of class and you play that by yourself. Dat, 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 dat. It's yeah, just, that's a nothing. lonely time. It's a lonely time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think <laughs> since we don't really have solo options, it, it makes a lot of sense for drummers to want to create. And I, um, I mean, personally, as a drummer, I, I can actually imagine being a piano player that just plays classical, like learns pieces, expresses them in certain ways. I can imagine doing that and it being rewarding. I can't imagine playing the drums with no ability to improvise and it being fun, right? So learning song after song exactly as they're supposed to be and playing along to the record, there's some satisfaction in that for sure. And some people are all about it, you know, different strokes for different folks. But for me personally, if there wasn't improvisation involved with drums, I don't think I would keep playing the drums. I would pivot to something else that when I didn't improvise, when I learned something exactly, it sounded like music that stood on its own two legs. You know what I mean? So sure. t- to me, it's like the whole reward of thousands of hours of practice is to be able to sit down, let stuff come out, and like the sound. Yeah, That to me is cool. At some point, yeah. it's like, like I said, with like riding a bike, it's like you have to pay attention. You're in it. You're solving problems in real time. You're staying balanced. And it's just, it's just fun. And like on a bike, for some reason, it's fun to go fast. You start going fast, and you're like, yeah. Hell yeah, I don't know why this is fun, but it is. It's like that on the drums. You're pushing yourself in different ways. It doesn't have to be fast, but it can be complexity, fast, whatever. Yeah. And there's just something about it when you are making it up that is like riding a bike that's just like really inherently rewarding. And it's not, I mean, I've yeah. memorized, I've had to learn exact songs and it feels good to like nail a part. Don't get me wrong. But it's yes. not the same fulfillment. Like I don't want to then go home and play the part again on my drums after the show sure. or something. You know what sure. I mean? Whereas I do yeah. want to go make more music by myself, improvising. Which, again, if you're one of those people at home who does like to play the exact thing each time and nail it perfectly, there's nothing wrong with that. No. I always like to say that where there's everyone's different uh, where they have their own style that they like. But um, one thing I think is interesting, I think I have found that I find out that it becomes abundantly clear that like I enjoy having the freedom to play the drums from 25 plus years of playing that like, okay, I've done this long time. It just, I don't, I don't have to think about it. That becomes abundantly clear when I sit down with like a little ukulele and play with my kids or on the piano. And I go, Oh, I don't have it on these other instruments. Like, Oh, I do have it on the drums, but when I'm sitting here playing the ukulele and I know four chords and I'm trying to do something else, I'm like, Oh, that's the freedom that I don't have. So I do have to stick to doing four chords over and over again or change them up, but it impresses a three-year-old. So that's all that matters in, in my house. But um, you, you, you realize that when you try to pivot and play something else, you're like, Oh, that's what other people might not feel when they're starting out. That frustration of being stuck, you know? Yeah. And it, it makes you grateful for whatever level of freedom you do have, not even on an instrument, on anything you can have fun, you know, not even expressing yourself, just doing, you know what I mean? Yeah. A sport, cooking, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Sports. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm with you. Um, it's very interesting. Now, the next kind of question I have for you is uh, improvising. Is it genre specific? People think of uh, improvising. First thing that comes to mind is jazz guys just making things up as they go. Totally. Um, but but then you also think of like jam bands. Then you also think of uh, rock bands who play the same song the same way every single night. And drummers who are famous for that. But could they be improvising? So what's your thought on it being genre specific? Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, improv. I don't think improvisation thrives in any particular genre more than others. Maybe, you know, maybe a little bit. Sure. Maybe there are some genres that are a little bit more conducive to it, but not in an exclusive sense, right? So, I mean, and I feel like nowadays, since the, you know, streaming revolution, like everyone has access to everything all the time. And the result, one of the happy results is musicians, at least a lot of musicians I know, tend to be very not genre specific anymore in the way that they used to be. I, I rarely meet someone that's like, I, li- I like rock and roll. I play rock and roll. Yeah, They're like, yeah, yeah, of course. I like everything. I listen to all sorts yeah. of stuff. And therefore, I think people are exposed to more ideas and potentially more creative ideas and potentially more uh, 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 places where some form of improv can happen. But ag- again, like, I don't think of improv as taking a solo like for example great example matt garska animals as leaders are you familiar yes and i saw him do a clinic at um i guess what was that was it pasic was the last one i saw uh my brain is i've seen him do a live clinic and it was incredible yeah matt is an absolute beast he he lived across the hall from me when we were at berkeley many years ago and uh, you know it's been really amazing to see him succeed because he has worked harder than anyone i know and it, you can just see the payoff in, in the time spent. But the reason I bring him up, him up is he is in an extremely right technical progressive metal band. Um, yes. And when they go play a show, Matt is improvising a ton throughout an Animals as Leader show, despite the fact that the parts are written. But the point I actually want to make is that when Matt writes parts for the band, right, Matt, the, his ability to create is where these ideas come from. It's why the the parts in the albums are so interesting is because his uh, uh, awareness of the possibilities has been pushed, not by sitting and doing like math with uh, notes. Of course, he totally does that too, to some degree, I'm sure. But it's like his improv has pushed him to a place where his available options are there. And that's what... I, I feel like it's important to also sort of emphasize here. It's like, yes, improvisation by yourself can be very rewarding. In a band where you need to take a solo, obviously very useful, but mm-hmm. it's way deeper than that in that when you are practicing improv, that is when you are simply developing options that you could possibly use, right? You're just extending what you understand about the possibilities of the drums so that when you go to write with your rock band or your folk band, or your funk band, or yes, your jazz band, the parts you're able to come up with are way more expansive. And, right? So it's like, in a yeah. sense, studying improv is really just like being becoming an expert in rhythm, melodies, and developing the facility to execute those melodies applied in different ways. So as much as it is and can be a creative expression, it's also just how you develop vocabulary on the drums and from there it applies and this is where to come back to the genre idea is like if genres don't you know it's like yeah i I will play a show for an hour and never need to like improvise a drum solo but i'm making creative decisions along the way a fill here uh like how i'm doing the ghost notes the melodies i choose to use on the bell of the ride symbol these are all bits of improv and they're sprinkled in along the way, kind of the whole time. It's like, I heard someone say this many, many, many years ago. They're like, the payoff of meditation is not in having a good day. It's in a thousand uh, uh, like unrecognizable, tiny improvements. And it's kind of like that with improv. Yeah. It's like when you go play the drums, at sort of every moment, 
thing, you have more options. You're thinking more deeply about the drums. Uh, you can make a move that you couldn't make before. And even if you're playing a pretty tight written set, like those things still show up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you kind of touched on it, but fills seem to be the kind of like, if if anywhere in the set you're going to improvise, it seems like fills are sort of like, in our brains, we can have fun. You know what I mean? That's kind of the area to improvise and do whatever you want, unless you're in a band where it's an iconic fill yeah. and they expect that fill each time. But play um, that fill. Play that fill. We People came to hear like in the air tonight kind of like <laughs> yeah, fills yeah. in the song. But I think that's that's where you can sort of maybe if if people are learning about it and you're the expert on this, but that seems like a good spot to kind of dip your toe in to get a little more interesting is change up what you're going to do each time. And that's yeah, improvising. A hundred percent. And not to not not to take everything you tee up into some abstract drum lesson, but I'm going to do it anyways. You're exactly right. Filling is the first place we go when we're thinking about like, OK, I, I have a chance to do cool drum stuff. I, I, want, I don't want to play the same fill over and over again. And I feel like I do. The way that I've had success teaching fills is to play the in, to develop the ability to play the infinite drum fill. Right? It's what I call flow mode, right? And it's just like playing the drums without playing a groove. The idea behind it is if you can play a drum fill, you know, a solo or flow on the kit for 20 minutes straight and you develop some vocabulary within that, well, you can do that easily. You can play a variety of melodies. You can do it at different tempos, different volumes. Then when it comes time to play a fill, you don't have to think, okay, which of my five like fills that I can remember am I going to execute? You're like, I'm good at flowing. I'm going to flip even with, even with limited vocabulary. Now I have a fill for one measure. I'm flipping into flow mode, which is easy for me. I've developed it on the kit for the last couple months. I flip into yeah. flow mode. I know what vocabulary is available. I know what's not, I'm not good at. And I execute that fill and I get out of it and I'm back in groove mode. And yep. then when the time comes to, and then it's kind of like, no matter how long the fill is, you're able to just flow. Sure. So yes, a hundred percent fills are sort of like a window into the vast world of potentially developing just like flow on the kit, infinite flow kind of thing, which is an exciting you know, sort of entry point. It is exciting. And then after your 20 minute drum fill, your band is like, dude, stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so then the the you know the next thought too is what about metronome and practicing mm. to a click and improvising to a click because uh you got to have both. I mean, I think from having studio experience, the best thing in the world that you can do is practice to a metronome when you're younger and like build that like internal click and not rush on the fills because if you're improvising sometimes you're you lose it. You mm -hmm. speed up, but you don't mm -hmm. want to be too uh stuck to the metronome so how do you how do you yeah. handle that with practicing i mean i think you're absolutely right the only the only uh practice related thought that i have on the metronome is that i sometimes need to i more often need to con there actually you know there's a lot of different types of people and students but there's one type of of, of drummer and person who is like i must practice to the metronome I must, and there's, there's typically like a very organized, I don't want to stereotype, but like a very organized person that's like, by the book, we're going to do this. I'm going to yeah. do every page of this book and oh, metronome's always on and that's how they think. More often than not, I need to tell people that when they are learning brand new vocabulary and it's like really rocky still, so they're learning to, let's say, do flow mode and I've given them three patterns to get good at rearranging on the fly. Sometimes you need to be able to in the practice room, be like slowing down, like, what was this pattern? Okay, let me speed it. Messing up. Okay. And if you're always going to the metronome, turn up, down, up, yeah. down, totally interrupting the flow. So it's interesting. I oftentimes need people like, need to tell super organized practicers, like, it's okay not to use the metronome until you have like a, a baseline with this stuff. Sure. And then, as you said, 100%, like, let's get the metronome going. Let's make sure that we're not habitually returning to the same tempo every time, no matter where we start. Yeah. Um, you know, because, like, certain patterns have certain, like, comfort tempos. Um, yeah. But, yeah, 100%. I honestly, I've always been so bad with keeping up my metronome practice, and sometimes it bites me yeah. in the butt. I got to say. 
I'm no. the opposite. I'm That's, like the most non-technical practicer ever. I'm like, come in and I'm like, okay, I'm going to create. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. But you need both. But it's, it's funny yeah. to hear, have, have you say that because I mean, you're a very respected teacher and it's like, but we, if we, if we don't have something that we're like working on, then, um, you're not trying hard enough. I hope that doesn't come out the wrong way. We're like, there's mm -hmm. always something to do. And I think about that with totally. podcasting where I'm like, if at night or whatever, I'm not like, you know, changing YouTube descriptions, there's always something you can be oh, doing. Yeah. I'm sure you feel the same with like your website and mm -hmm. your courses. There's, there's literally, there's never a time where there's not something you could be working on. Oh yeah. The list of, the long list of, of like uh, courses I'd like to film is, is many, many years of filming and watching. Uh, we'll get good. there. Yeah. 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 I think we all have, uh, we all have our go-to beats. We have, uh, I have friends where I think, when I think of them, I think, like I think of his, that my friends go to beat where if I, you know what, we have like a practice space. I walk down the hall, he's a guitarist. I hear it and I go, oh, that's him on the drums. Mm -hmm. How do you break being stuck with that go to beat? I mean, we all kind mm -hmm. of have that where we, we go to our comfort zone. We get our, our blankie, our drum blankie and we're nice and comfy. How do you get out of that? Yeah, I, I would say there's, I would, I would point to two areas. One is within the setting that that habitual groove exists, making sure that you've, you've expanded um, that subset of vocabulary so that if it's it's kind of like a fast drum and bass thing, sounds like to me. Yeah. So if we yeah. kind of roughly label it as fast drum and bass stuff, can we, like, so we don't actually play that specific groove how can we um, create a lot of variation within that drum and bass quick space? So like, what would a halftime groove sound like? Um, what if we do different backbeats that aren't on two and four, alternate backbeats? What can we think about with our ghost notes? Uh, is there room for like triplet embellishments in here? Uh, can we, what would it mean to add a lot of space to this groove? And that might show you like, what melodies am I having trouble playing? Right, so you could like dig into the actual area of habit and push it outward so that you're not literally playing the same groove. Sure. And then the other thing I'd say is like, okay, uh, this go-to groove is a perfectly fine groove. Let's not throw it away. Let's keep it. And let's just think like, what would be a nice complement to that that is substantially different? So let's say it's... Yeah. Uh, a groove that's like a halftime triplet groove. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. It's a groove. In theory, you could move between them if the tempo was right. But then to get out of the, you know, your habitual groove, it's like, okay, now I've identified a different feel, a different tempo. Let me build vocabulary here and let me essentially find what my habitual go-to groove is in this setting. Because truthfully... Yeah. If you turn on a metronome and it's, you know, tell me it's straight time or triplets, I'm going to end up, if I'm sort of mindlessly just like, first thing that comes out, sure, I'm probably going to play a groove I play a lot at that tempo in that yeah. feel. So everyone's For got sure. these go-to grooves, like my drum and bass grooves, total like go-to stuff, whatever, yeah. you name the genre, it's there. Um, and that's fine, but I think it helps to say like, okay, if I'm going to have like go-to groups, let me get at least like five of them in different fields going on. And then within those, once I kind of recognize what my habits are, but now they're more expansive, I can dig into each one and push the boundaries slowly. And you can even push the boundaries in the same way. You could say, I'm going to visit all of my habitual grooves and explore alternate backbeats. So I'm not going to hit two and four every time. I'm going to say, what happens if I anticipate the backbeat? Dun, ka. Okay, I'm in triplets. Yeah. Okay, I'm in halftime. Whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Anticipated backbeats, whatever it is. You can yeah. sort of apply yeah. the same creative tool across the board. That'd be one way to expand. One way to expand. Yeah. But and again, it's all about... Like it, it's all Stop about doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stop. Do anything else. I do tell that That's to you students a lot. <laughs> you always play this pattern. So for the next several weeks, never play that pattern. Like you have yeah, to play you, other melodies or whatever it is. You got it. You got it down. Move on to something else. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if habitual groove is not a jam band, it should be. I think that's a good uh, <laughs> <100%. band> name. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's talk about like your 
method. I mean, we we have been, but your website and mm-hmm. your courses and there's the improvisers club and all that stuff. Um, you have a very cool setup. Um, obviously, we actually for this recording, we have both have SM7Bs and Sony headphones <laughs> and stuff like that. And um, I- uh, so what is it like when, when you're teaching courses, how does it work online teaching? Um, I've done a few lessons, but I've done it with a few people who it was earlier on and it wasn't what it is now where it was just like, I would play and then he would play and then both the volumes would duck out. And it was like, wait, I can't hear anything that's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So how does the process work of like taking lessons with you? Yeah. Well, there's private lessons, which I teach, uh, you know, on zoom right now. And those are pretty. Those are pretty straightforward, kind of like this. Um, but the the vast majority of education related online stuff I'm doing is through my website, which is never live, and it's not one on one. Well, there's one on one feedback, but it's not Got live. It. So my teaching situation is one where I'm recording lessons, uh, lessons within chapters within courses. I'd say the average length is like twelve lessons in a course, hmm. and every course is the goal of everything on my website, again, I specialize in, in developing freedom on the kit, so the ability to, to improvise, be creative with vocabulary. Every course is a subset of, of vocabulary, right? So the one I'm working on right now is triplet linear flow grooves. Right? This is really, you know, there's a lot of in, vocabulary that's specific to the site that you start to get to know after yeah. a while. Basically, sure. it's the ability to go to boom, that type of groove, but like a lot of control, a lot of variation possible. But other ones will be like the drum and bass course. So it's like, okay, you start with the drum and bass 101 groove. But again, the point is to be able to develop the ability to improvise within that. So that's like a, I don't know, 12-ish lesson course, two chapters. And by the end of it, like for chapter one is basically the ability to uh, shift uh, notes, <laughs> shift melodic notes in a drum and bass esque style, and make infinite melodies just with the grooves. Right, so doom, cat, doom, doom, cat, cat, doom, cat, doom, 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 cat, doom, cat, doom, cat, cat, doom. So I, there's a specific approach, step by step, to being able to just kind of shift those notes around and essentially improvise within those tight constraints, like we've said. Chapter two is embellishments. So now you've got the ability to improvise the melody of the groove, the kicks and backbeats. Now let's look at all of the stuff, the variations we can pile on top of that, which sort of has the effect of like exponentially multiplying what is the perceived uh, uh, like variation. And and by the end of the course, you're still, and this is again, the mantra, you're thinking pretty simple thoughts because first you got good at this specific technique for creating the melodies, which now is automatic. And then you throw in five or six variations to the patterns that each have a melodic variation built into it, but you're just thinking the original melodic variation. So you're thinking simple thoughts, but you're adding these variations so that the listener um, receives something that seems really crazy varied and complex. So anyways, that's sort of the the a really typical form of okay. one of my courses. And I I have begun to think of my courses I'm I'm very offline, right? So I I don't really know what other educators are up to out there to be honest. But I know from my appearances in other places where I will sometimes do a guest series of lessons or something that sort of in line with the sort of stereotype of the day, like everyone's attention spans are really, you know, really short. We got to keep all the lessons to three minutes. It has to be, you yeah. know, fit in an Instagram reel or something. Yeah. I have really re- resisted that very comfortably. And I treat my lessons a lot more like a university course, to be honest. So like I just posted or just filmed, you know, a few lessons that were 30 minutes, 40 minute lessons and I'm, it's pretty demanding of students, but that's the environment I want to create. I want, I want people to come to this, not for entertainment. I want them to come for a serious educational experience, like a course that you would take in college. And I went to Berkeley College of Music, mm-hmm. so I, I know what a rigorous course is meant to do. I just got a degree in psychology again, uh, oh, just wow. recently. And that was, I feel like in some way that I probably haven't recognized till right now, really influential on my uh, willingness to lean into the rigor that I'm trying to create on the site 
because to me, like, I don't, personally, I don't need fun videos. The fun is getting good at the drums. The fun is having freedom and playing what's in my head. So since I've leaned into that, I have, you might think that people would have like, been like, ah, this is, you know, it's like, who has time to watch these lessons? And like, this, I'm asking too much and la da da. But I've had the exact opposite. I've had people doubling down on the seriousness and being like, thank God, there's like a really deep, deep dive on yeah. these subjects. And I love that. Cause like, you're more invested, you know, it's longer. You've put the time in. It's more, uh, there's nothing wrong with the short ones. I mean, I've seen multiple of the different sites and they're little, Hey, here's the groove. Here's how you play it. But it sounds like with, and I haven't dug into your particular courses, but it's like when something's 45 or 50 minutes long, you definitely have more, uh, there's more room to explain. Yeah. You're more sitting down. Your focus is, you know, yes, people have short attention spans. We all know that. I mean, you, I feel like we're similar in age and you always hear that kind of thing about, uh, our generation, but like, that's not always the case. If you're into yeah. something, you can spend an hour or two hours, whatever, working on it. A hundred percent. And yeah. I think if, and as again, like everyone's obviously doing things differently and it's perfectly fine. Uh, like some students want uh, some smaller takeaways. Some students want to do a super deep dive. Some students want to dive deeper and, you know, go further and stuff than, than I provide too. Um, I mean, when you commit to college, to like music university, you're essentially saying like, wow, I'm, I'm like going deep, 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 deep dive. But in, in general, I'm just finding that if I want to, I mean, this is every, <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just say this. I, the site is kind of, the way that I teach is just kind of reflection of who I am, how I think and what I'm excited about with the drums. I like thinking hard about these things, thinking about, a whole system that underpins it, the philosophy underneath it, how to convey this in in some certain way, and like is always the case with a you know a band, uh, uh, an educational thing, whatever, a blog. You find people who are like you, you know. So it's like the the people who are attracted to what I'm doing, um, they're they're in it, and it's like I'm not. It's not going to be a bad fit for people because if it was the people for whom it's a bad fit, they just don't sign up. Or they sign up yeah. for a free month and then they bail or something. Sure. And that's fine. So it turns into a community of people who are like studying pretty darn hard on the stuff. And it's also, I was thinking about this the other day, is like your typical college course is 14 weeks or so, semester. Most of my classes are about 12 courses long and, or 12 lessons long. And again, I'm kind of asking you to, to do a lot of practice between, I, I try to plan the lesson so that it's a week of practicing required to like get control over the content. So it's not a lot of quick payoff in a sense, which some people would say like, that's a terrible business model. And I'm like, I know, yeah. but I think it's sustainable <laughs> because it's exciting yeah, for me. You need that. I mean, growing up taking drum lessons, it was week after week after week after week after week. After yeah, month, an hour long like, or half hour lesson, you know? Yeah. But if people don't like that, there's plenty of other different totally. ty types of teachers. Because I think, I mean, growing up, I had... Okay, this teacher, I didn't really like that guy. Okay, this teacher, I love this guy. Okay, let me try someone else. Let me learn from this. You, you, yeah. Not every teacher matches every single person. And you don't um, always need, like, I personally, I don't like really long courses. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> Ironic, yeah. I'm the type of learner that, like, I, I, I want to be shown, like, some small idea. And it has to be the right idea. There's some amount of luck involved here. But, you know, I took a lesson a couple months ago. And the, the teacher mentioned something like in passing that wasn't even the focus of the lesson. And that ended up being like the seed for months of practice that I'm still doing. I was like, oh, that. And again, it, it's exactly how my website works. Again, it's the same. It's just me in website form. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to create a giant system out of this. I'm going to create all the vocab and be able to play all the melodies and have control over this. And I'm still working on it and still finding like new ways to push the boundaries. So I'm basically like doing the course I would make, but in my own practice, but it's not, it, it's just this like moment. I mean, it was literally 20 seconds of a lesson where something, and at the, at the moment, I didn't even process that it was interesting. It was actually when I went home, I was like, what was that lick he was playing? And I started trying to figure it out and I was like, oh, this has crazy potential. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, to your point, everyone yes, needs yeah. something different, learns differently, and needs different things at different times in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the very beginning, totally. you need guidance, obviously. Yeah. Um, we need certain, it to be fun and not get overburdened and like, oh, I hate this. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think you have built a very cool like brand. I mean, it's 2023 nowadays, like you can do it all on your own where you're in, in, I have my own take on it of doing social media and building all that stuff. And, and, and everyone has their own little universe that we can build. Do you have any tips for people who might want to become a, um, you know, a personality in the drum world on YouTube? Um, maybe being an online teacher, whatever, you don't have to give away secrets with that, but just in general with like Instagram and all this stuff, I think, I think people young and old, all want to play the drums, get recognized for it. There's a lot of different ways to do it now, uh, but whatever that means, recording tips, uh, gear, uh, what's your take on on your journey of like building this brand? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think the most important thing is to do something is to make sure, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but like uh, fine, not even fine, like identify what your authentic mode of giving is um because you know i've been i just celebrated the 10 year anniversary actually on in f- six days from now 10 year anniversary of teaching online that's when i launched the wow. original jp music.com um it's gonna it i for it to work it's gotta be sustainable and it for it to be sustainable it has to be enjoyable which like means you have to just be able to go and do you. I, I, I've always been super resistant to like putting on sort of a character or like, you know, more excitement than I really feel or whatever it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, yeah. go be you. People like when you are you. People like when people are real and you can see it in a second. I remember there was a clinic I was watching and it was the guys, a young guys, this was so so long ago. I was young too. It was his first clinic and it was a real moment of, of of insight for me. He was really nervous about the clinic and he was teaching it, you know, very like by the plan that he had made and you felt like you were watching a presentation. It was good. And then there was one moment where he, he like he dropped a stick or something happened and he like kind of swore and he's like, ah, oh, my bad. And <laughs> like suddenly I loved this guy. I was like, that's yeah. the guy. I want that guy all the time. And it was just such a moment where I was like, wow, like we really need, and we are really attracted to like real people. That That's my biggest piece of advice is like find the way that you authentically give because then it'll be easy and you don't have to like will you drag yourself to the practice room. Like, okay, I'm going to like, I'm going to try to teach this thing that's like not really my thing or like I'm going to go like be way more like bubbly and excited than I really am or whatever. It's like kind of find you. And if that means that you're finding your niche then great. Everyone says to do that in business um, and just kind of rock it and start and keep going. Yes, so, so you have true. to start. That's yep. the hardest part. And then you got to just do it. You don't, you get good at doing everything by doing it. If you want to get good at teaching a concept, go teach concepts over and over and over again. Um, and even if no one's really listening, there's value being generated because you're getting better at teaching and presenting. You're analyzing things better. You're creating better lessons, better systems, better ways of thinking about the drums. Um, but yeah, follow your interest. I mean, you. what's your story getting started on this? This is such a unique and beautiful podcast. And Thank surely you. this is just uh, uh, you sort of recognizing your authentic interests and building a brand around it. Well, that's true. And to give you the condensed version, basically 2018, I was in a band uh, for years with friends and it just kind of fizzled out. And I was like, all right, Uh, it was actually a 28. I was about, I was like, I'm going to be 30 in a little bit. I need to do something to break through in the drums. And my background work wise is recording uh, as as an engineer working in a studio. I was working on a bunch of um, different podcasts as that was coming up. And, uh, and then I said, well, I want to do my own. I want to be a, person in the drum community. And then I just kind of all fell into place. And I said, well, I'm going to learn more about the history of the drums. Let me learn from people uh, who are experts. And then uh, again, I've done voiceovers for work in the back, in the background, um, you know, here and there. And it just kind of all came together. 
But the social media stuff, which has grown to be where most people know me as an Instagram account, and then they find out there's a podcast. It's like, yeah, you got to just keep doing it. You got to keep posting. You got to keep finding what you're doing. And then, I mean, I, it, this is so much, I put so much work into each episode. Like if I put this time and effort into a different job, you know, I'd be making a lot more money, but I wouldn't be having as much fun and I wouldn't get to meet people like you and be in the community and be a member of that. Um, but it's, it's just been a long journey and you, I've learned the entire way. And, and I will add to what you said of templating things and being set up for success. Like if I came in each day and I had to set up my mic and set up the recorder and move the camera, you wouldn't it would do be it. so I'd stop. I'd be like, oh, God, this is terrible. So just setting yourself up for success like that. Is yeah. Like, Remove dude. resistance at every turn if you can. Streamline. Yes. And I don't know if I don't know what you've encountered in this regard, but I tend to find that people really don't care that much past a certain threshold about production quality. Not right? not anymore. After I COVID. used a handy cam to film lessons for eight years and basically made a living doing that and only upgraded stuff this year. Yeah. Um, and it's like, no, I've never had someone complain. Like the video quality is like kind of not the best it could possibly be. It's just like, dude, is the content cool? Like so many students, the reason I bring it up, so many students are like, I'm going to start posting stuff. Like after I spend, I just need to save up and spend $3,000 on recording and video gear. It's like, dude, literally 80% of the things I post are iPhone audio of me yeah. drumming. It sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just need to do it. I, I do think that, and I'm I'm guilty of it, where I want to do more YouTube videos and and focus on YouTube and do more like gear reviews and things and talk more about the other side of my background, which is like talk about this mic and talk about the gear. But I'm like, well, it's it's hard having a baby and a toddler, and you have a a, a five month old daughter, which again, congratulations to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the madness. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, just do it. That's that's the key thing here, and and yeah. or don't do it. Or don't, or don't feel do the need to do it. You know? Everyone doesn't have to be an influencer. If I if I would, had a normal job, I would not be on social media at all. Yeah. I am in a weird position where I kind of think social media is poison for the mind and society, but my entire business model kind of depends on it. So here I am, yeah. you know? And I'm at peace with that. I love that. And I actually, I should say, people know how to use social media way better than me. I'm just like so... So I was immediately addicted and scrolling and I'm just like completely yes, can't addictive. control myself. But I have friends that are like, what are you talking about? It's awesome. I learned so much. I, I, it's my encyclopedia. And they're right. I watch them literally becoming total masters of like random stuff on YouTube and Instagram. I'm like, damn, I suck yeah. at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're so right. That is the, the dark side of it is like I find myself, you find yourself checking your Instagram all the time but it's just it's a part of what we do and it, it is very addicting so it's a slippery slope but um, totally. but it's a it's powerful and you kind of have to be there yeah i know it's it's hard to imagine i know unless yeah. you're a gig I, I know some gigging musicians who don't have social media and i'm like damn that's cool <laughs> yeah, it's like one you know one cool. in ten thousand musicians they're like no i'm just that good i have i have friends they call me for gigs never yeah. started a facebook or instagram and i'm like wow that's a crazy life. It's yeah, not at all. Awesome. <laughs> but I'm like, no, it's wow, normal. hard to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good for them. Um, all right, JP, as we kind of wrap up here, man, why don't you tell people uh, where they can find you, your, your website name, social media, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, yes. So website, jpbavaymethod.com. And you know what? While we're at it, let's make a freaking promo code. Anyone listening, put in drum history promo code. I'm going to make it as soon as we're done. Cool. And you'll get a free month. Give it a try. I'm I'm really wow. excited and 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 proud of the stuff that I'm doing there. And students are really reliably learning to improvise and be creative on the kit. So jpvmethod.com. That's where uh, I'm teaching. And my band is called Childish Japes. Childish Japes putting out a new album this year, a double album, our fourth album. Um, wow. I'm very excited about that. And then, you know, I'm online. Just search my name to find stuff. I'll put it all in the description and uh that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't even talk about you playing in bands and stuff, because sometimes, honestly, you think of people uh, in your role who who live in a bubble and kind of just play in their in their um, house. And not, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But taking it out of the lesson room onto the stage is very cool. So um, congrats, totally. man. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's a whole whole different discussion. 
Cool. Well, um, thanks to everyone for listening. And JP, I appreciate you being here, man. And uh, like JP said, promo code drum history on JP method.com. Look in the description and you can see it there. Um, JP, keep up the good work, man. And I appreciate you being here. And uh, hopefully we can meet one day in person and hang out and uh, talk drums and, and all that good stuff. I hope so. Thanks for having me, Bart. 